Over the course of the series, we have looked at several strange and unnerving locations. From the art galleries of serial killers, to the dens of... well, of serial killers. Today is a little different, although the place is still unnerving. At the end of a long driveway, you arrive at this foreboding house, or manor, Krupp Manor to be exact. It is located here, at Nihant, Nihant, whatever, near Chapel and a Myrler Queen. This area can serve as a settlement, but before all that, let's unravel the story behind this place. To start off with, let me bring this to your attention. Up a makeshift ramp lies what I assume is the base of what would become a statue or a monument, the tools of which are still here. It tells us right off the bat that whoever dwelt in this majestic hovel was important and wealthy enough to not only buy a house in this area, but to get a monument constructed as well. Of course, there is every chance it would have been shit. Or this is actually the monument, in which case it is definitely shit. The rest of this driveway is pretty barren, but over in the rocks here is a car. Now, it's not overly significant, but it means that they were at least able to afford one. And, as we will soon see, it wasn't their only one. The outside of the house is a shambles, and when you first arrive, it will be crawling with ghouls. A very large number of them, in fact. However, as it will become apparent, these ghouls do in fact play a part in the story of this lovely manor. Another car is found at the side of the house, along with a bike as well, and it's in pretty good nick to be honest, suggesting someone may have been keeping it that way, as the cars are completely fucked. I do not, however, think it was this fine fellow's handiwork. A completely passive feral ghoul, it's a pretty odd thing. Now this seems to be pretty common and some people are of the opinion it's a bug. But as I will get to at the end of the episode, I in fact think this ghoul right here is something else entirely. The back of the house is not much to look at. I would have thought that a family this wealthy would have a dock of sorts, or a pier, but it doesn't seem to be the case. However, if you look into the water, you can see the tops of just about two boats sticking out. Now, I don't know whether they belong to the family or not, but there's a chance they did, which makes it two cars, two boats and a motorcycle. That, and the large amount of ghouls present here, makes me think most of these ghouls may in fact be part of the same family, and this does in fact turn out to be the case, though how many of them were part of it, I'm not too sure. Now to take a look at the charming inside. The staircase to the higher floors is still intact, as is the one leading to the basement, and we will make good use of both in time. Many of the walls are destroyed, either collapsed from simple decay, or missing altogether which means someone could have taken them apart for some reason, maybe supplies, or some tinker just stole them. Getting a bit further in, we come to the drink. Some is lying by these shelves, and if we turn left, we come to some more, clearly drank some time recently, by fallout standards anyway. Some empty tins of food can be found here as well, which is odd as this place is overrun with ghouls, so how did its occupants survive amongst them? Then there is this teddy, with drink behind it. Now, I can't tell whether they hid it for some reason, or used the teddy, which they may have fond memories of, as a way to stop them drinking it. Though that would be weird, as they drank everything else. Or, perhaps, who here just like getting shit-faced? Next, it's into a dining room of sorts, with the back wall collapsed. Now, it seems that the weight of the cabinet finally caused it, after several years, to collapse. There's a lot of rubble here, but these walls were plaster and wood so I'm going to chalk this down as oversight by Bethesda. I'm guessing the wall was either weakened by the blast, or the cabinet had so much shite in it, it was heavy enough to break the wall. Some cheeky tinker could have then stole everything out of it later. Now, for the dining table. It seems to have been set up for a meal at some point, though how long ago, and for what purpose, is uncertain, given what we soon learn. However, it's large enough to accommodate about 8 people, which means that a large number of people may have been here when the bombs went off. Now time to take a look at the second floor, which also has a large number of ghouls. Some of which may drop down on you as you wander about downstairs and scare the fuck out of you. The room opposite the top of the stairs has the... has the usual creepy mannequins that are a requirement in a place like this. However, there's also a safe in here, so I think this may have been a room in which they stored valuables and clothes. Possibly those of their guests, but I'm not sure. There's also a pipe pistol which shows that whoever was living here did so after the bombs hit, and was around long enough to procure one. The idea that all the mannequins were used for takes a bit of a beating with this one, 
It's just positioned to stir out the window for no reason at all, watching the world go by. Now, it clearly was moved by someone, I hope, and it was not the furrows that did it. Perhaps whoever lived here just wanted some company. Ooh. Next is what looks like an office space. The desk will be locked and you can get a key to the bedroom upstairs out of it. The floor is also fucked. Beside the red armchair in the corner of the room, an ashtray and a cigar can be found, which gives us some more information on our mystery resident, identifying them as a smoker, and a smoker of fine words at that. So they're a smoker and an alcoholic. Simply wonderful. Now it's upstairs and onto the bedroom, the key for what you got from the office desk downstairs. More cigars can be found on a side table here, and the door to the bedroom is locked. Now inside here was a glowing one and a dead weather ghoul. I don't really know where the corpse of the glowing one is now though, I looked around for it and couldn't find it. So two people were in here, and the bedroom door was locked. The weathered ghoul was already dead, for me anyway, leaving only the glowing one alive. Though why they never just dropped down the massive hole in the bedroom floors beyond me. Seems like the simple solution. Now we don't really know yet what causes a ghoul to wither, although it is accepted that glowing ones are the result of too much radiation. If inactivity or lack of radiation is the cause of a ghoul withering or dying, then we can explain it. Either it stopped moving after spending so long trapped in this room, or any radiation that would have sustained it was taken by the now glowing ghoul. As for who they were, I think they were the owners of the house, possibly husband and wife. So let's go over what we know. This is an old house, owned by a family most likely called Krupp. They were either wealthy enough to own several cars, a motorbike, possibly a boat or two, or many people were visiting at the time of the bombs. Whatever was the case, a lot of people lived here, and most likely made up some of the ghoul number found in this house. The current owners, or at least the previous ones before the bombs hit, were most likely the two we find in the bedroom, possibly a married couple. Someone else is living here too, and they do not seem feral. If we descend the stairs to the basement, we can find another mannequin, and this ghoul here, originally encountered locked in the basement itself, the key for which was in the bedroom. So the basement is a shambles. A leak seems to have flooded the whole thing, though it's amazing the water still works. The culprit for all wrong in this house is floating about down here as well, the plunger, which I'm sure was also the cause of the leak, because plungers in the Fallout universe are just like that. Another interesting thing, I think the amount of paintings down here matches the amount missing from frames upstairs as well. Also, these windows lead to another dimension. There are no windows visible outside and they don't reflect the current weather, so Moses only knows where they go. The rest of the basement looks like a decent enough attempt was made to make a livable space, though considering that we encounter ghouls down here, it is odd that any of this is here at all, as it's clear someone locked these ghouls in here, as this was set up after the bombs hit. Somehow they managed to spider pig their way up here and nail up all the windows, but I have nay a clue how. Also, there was a weird Jangles the Moon Monkey thing down here that involved a fishing rod, a Jangles the Moon Monkey and a flotation device, but I can't find it now. And now, for the person who lived here, responsible for all of this. The non-furrow ghoul lying dead as a doorknob here, Theodore Crew. A non-furrow ghoul that seems to have done quite well for himself, and the former pre- and post-war resident of this house and as we shall see in a minute, responsible for a lot of what was set up in and around here. So it seems he was living down here, and had set up quite a lot of stuff, from a fridge for food, to doing something to the electrical wiring, which along with the water might be the reason that he's dead, though if that was the case the water should still be electrified, and the other ghouls down here weren't dead. Well, bar this one on the right here, which is dead when we showed up, and I'll get to that. Now for Theodore's terminal entries. So he has four, and the first is from the 15th of January. So apparently their family took part in a bad stock trade, and that sent their dynasty into ruin. And I think it happened just shortly before the war. Apparently Theodore watched the bombs drop, but then talks about having his skin slide off in his sleep. I think this was directed at his father, who lived in the house as well. If so, then he was probably one of the ghouls up in the third floor bedroom, which means the other one must have been his wife, i.e. Theodore's mother. The next is from the 2nd of February, a few weeks later. So he was the one who locked the other ghouls in the basement, and he put the key upstairs. Now given the number and what we've discussed, I think it's likely that he didn't get all of them, and some were either still out and about, or in the bedroom, like I think his parents were. 
He has encountered a few other people and it appears there are a few other non-furrows about, but they are being attacked the same as the furrows. And given that it's only been a few months, I can sort of understand why people would still be so frightened of them. Shit, some people are still really frightened of them centuries later. We also get some interesting info. Feral ghouls do not attack their own, feral or otherwise. Though I assume this doesn't extend to those who go out of their way to do them harm. The third is from the 2nd of October, more than half a year on. It's weird as it seems he waited this long before he tried to go into the basement. Also, he keeps saying the rest of the family. And while it could mean everyone besides him, I still think it means the ones that he managed to get in there. He plans to try and restore them as people, to make them talk and act like they used to, and in doing so, rebuild their dynasty. Ha, <laughs> good luck with that. The last one just says who cares, and we can see why when we read it. So this entry is a few centuries after the last one. So a few realizations have come to young Theodore. The first is that ghouls don't die. Well, at least we think they don't. A lot of conflicting evidence there, but that is for another time. His efforts to train his family have... Uh, not went well. His cousin James may be the only one who learned anything, and he isn't sure whether or not it was a fluke. He says he's going to kill his Aunt Belinda if she doesn't listen to him, and that is the last entry, and the last we hear of him. So I assume that this dead ghoul is his Aunt Belinda, and in the end, he did bash her head in. I also think this is how he died. See, ghouls may not go out of their way to attack non-feral ghouls, in fact they ignore them, but if Theodore did attack Belinda, I think it's likely that the other ghouls turned on him and killed him. It is sad though, as this basement is evidence of his attempt to civilize them, chairs to sit on, a table to eat at, a chess or checkers board to play on. He made attempts to change them, though how long he tried I'm, I'm not really sure. And to be fair to him, he did last a few centuries before, you know, he snapped and got himself killed. Croup Manor, one of the most upscale shitholes we have explored thus far. The remains of a once great family lived here, left in ruin by a bad stock. The bombs dropped and turned them all into ghouls, all feral, bar Theodore. Now I have discussed that I think his parents are upstairs, and we know at least his aunt and cousins were here. The rest of the ghouls could have wandered in over the years, but some may be family as well, in which case I'm not sure why they were here so early in the morning, as you know, that's when the bombs dropped. Maybe a party or brunch or some shit like that. Theodore tried to train his family but he eventually failed and it was probably before the last post, and he resorted to drink. However, I have my suspicions that the docile ghoul out the back is James. However, when all is said and done, it appears the only same member of the family left was ironically, possibly the first one to die. The rest of them still wander this old matter, living out the rest of their immortal lives as shadows of their former selves. Or at least they did until we showed up and executed them all just so the place looked cleared on our map. The home of a once great family, and the remains of its members. I hope you liked this look at all of it. If you did like it, give the video a like, and if you want regular updates, subscribe. Any suggestions for lore or future videos should be left in the comments below. Better yet, go on to my subreddit, so we can discuss them there in more detail. It's linked in the description. If you wish to, you can support me on Patreon. I only ask for a pound or a quid, no more no less. And if there are any rewards that you would like to see there that aren't currently there, please tell me. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook to get regular updates or have a wee chat. Any business you wish to discuss, email me at endapple.business at gmail.com and I will get back to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.